أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء وسيد المرسلين حبيبنا ونبينا وشفيع نفوسنا أبي القاسم محمد المصطفى صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين الغر الميامين المظلومين ولعنة الله على عدائهم أجمعين Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. My beloved brothers and sisters and respected viewers, welcome to yet another T3. Teach, talk and thrive inshallah. As always, I'm your host for tonight, Ali Al-Burji, and we are blessed and honored to have with us Sayyid Shabir Kirmani from the United States of America. Assalamu alaikum Sayyidna. Wa alaikum as How are you? Inshallah, everything's all right? Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah wa shukr. I'm actually quite uh, excited today. We will be discussing a topic of leadership. Mm. Very crucial, important topic. Mm. Now, with regards to leadership, how important is it in development? Bismillah. Leadership is extremely important in development. A leadership and a leader has to basically get people, uh, tell people their vision, inspire them and bring them all together to move towards a common goal. And that goal could be either in a business and success towards that front. That could be in an educational institution, a university or a college or something of that like. That could be on a personal level, even within a family structure. And indeed that could be at the level of a religion, a global religion, such as the one that was established by our Holy Prophet Rasulullah uh, himself. Uh, and it requires a tremendous amount of <coughs> strength of will. It requires a lot of... A lot of good communication, and also clarification of vision. Rasulullah was someone who had a tremendous amount of influence on the world. And if there's any one word that can probably define what is leadership, it's actually the ability to influence. Now, people can be good leaders or bad leaders. It really depends on them. Meaning that somebody can use their skills and their talents of being a leader for negative, or they can use it for positive. Of course, Ahlul Bayt salam always use it for the best of intentions. But if we look at books like, for example, 100, the most influential people in history that was written by Michael H. Hart, in which he listed the most influential people that he thought in history existed, in the top five he puts Confucius, Buddha, Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, Isaac Newton, and also at number one he puts the Holy Prophet Rasulullah at number one. He says there's been no person in history that's been as influential as the Holy Prophet in the global scheme of the world, the global, global system of the world. <clears throat> and they asked him why. You know, he himself says that, you know, people would be really surprised as to my decision of choosing Muhammad as the most influential person. Now, influence, as I mentioned, can be positive or negative, And we take on board that Rasulullah had a tremendous amount of influence. Michael H. Hart says, everyone else on the list brought either a secular system or a spiritual system, one or the other. So for example, Confucius is known for his spiritual system, or Buddha is known for his spiritual system. Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, is known for the spiritual system that he brought. Isaac Newton, interestingly, is known for the secular system that he brought. An interesting side note of Isaac Newton is that although Isaac Newton is known for his contributions to physics and mathematics and science in general, he actually wrote extensively on God, in particular on monotheism. Newton, Newton was an adamant monotheist, meaning he rejected the Trinity to the point that he was affiliated and associated with Cambridge University, not too far away from here. And he had the Lucasian chair of mathematics. The Lucasian chair was also the chair that was held afterwards after, by individuals like Stephen Hawking. In any event, he, at that time, the church relationship with Cambridge University was very strong. To the point that you needed to, for example, pledge your allegiance or vow to the Trinity. And <clears throat> Isaac Newton did not believe in this to the extent that he went and got special exemption to not have to do this because he had to be a priest, uh, ordained as a priest to be able to be a professor. And he said, I don't believe in the Trinity. I only believe in that one God because Jesus himself never said that he was, that there was a Trinity. Um, this happened after various things that happened in the, in the history of, of Christianity. Interesting. And uh, we need to be mindful that anyways, 
Isaac Newton wrote a lot about religion, but was known for his secular contributions. <coughs> and number Isn't one... Isn't that contradicting, though? Sorry to interrupt you. Sure. What, what do you mean? Uh, for example, secularism. Mm. Secularism basically removes the law of God mm. and allows man to place his own laws. Mm. So if you're a believer in monotheism, how can you then go and uh, write um, the secular system or well, contribute to it? Well, in, in this context, when we say secular, we mean not having directly to do with religion. It doesn't necessarily mean anti-religion. Secular just in the sense that, you know, he's known for his science and mathematics. Now, someone who's involved in science and mathematics, they can be either religious or not religious, up to them. That's, so we mean in the sense of secular meaning in this context, not relating to religion, but not anti-religion at the same time. So number, he said number two was Newton. And the man, the author, may be a little bit biased because he was a he was an hist he's an historian and a astrophysicist. That's his day job. His primary job is astrophysicist. Anyways, number one on the list, the most important person he said, the most influential person he said, was the Holy Prophet, was Muhammad, according to him. And he said the reason for this is he's the only individual on my list who brought a spiritual system and a secular system and had influence in both of them. And now, Muhammad. having said that, a, some person may critique and respond and say, you know, but this person says uses the word influence. Influence can be good and bad. And I'm saying that from the beginning that I accept this notion that influence can be good and bad. And maybe this person did not have the same spiritual relationship to the Prophet, but that's okay. We'll, we'll leave it at that. Now, at least he recognized him mm. as an intellectual mm. and for the achievements, mm -hmm. what he achieved uh, during uh, his era. In Some people may try to dismiss, dismiss Rasulullah by saying he was, God forbid, God forbid, a warmonger and things, allegations that have been made on, on him mm -hmm. over time and over history. And anyone who's studied the man in depth, Rasulullah would realize that he is far from that and he was someone who could actually lead the modern world. And I'm not the one to say this. This is people like George Bernard Shaw who said, Muhammad, I've read the man. And I believe that had Europe taken over his, was the leadership was of Europe was taken over by this man, it would succeed and thrive and things like this. What I'm saying is, Rasulullah had it was a leader of the highest caliber. The Holy Prophet was a leader of the highest caliber, and the notion of leadership was exemplified by by Rasulullah, by Rasulullah. You know, and uh, to go a little bit more extensively on that, what system should lead the world today? You know, we talk about democracy, and democracy is there. But what were ancient philosophers saying about democracy? Was democracy, and is democracy the best form of government? Well, Plato didn't think so. In his Republic, he argued otherwise. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and other philosophers had said, had, the, had said the same thing. Even modern leaders have said the same thing. We're told that Winston Churchill has said this as well, that, you know, democracy is the worst form of government, except that everything else has been tried. So what is the right form of government? According to Plato in his Republic, the right form of government is where you have a philosopher king, where he said the world will not see justice until all philosophers become kings and all kings become philosophers. Now, philosopher was a placeholder for an intellectual, intelligent person, a person who was well-read, literate, and someone who used their mind and rationale. This is important to note. Because over time, philosophy branched out into different fields and became science and history and different fields and political science and economics and the likes. But philosophy was just knowledge at that time. And so he said, the world will not see peace and justice until all philosophers become kings and all kings become philosophers. And he said, that means that those people who are in power, they must also be intellectually enlightened. And those who are intellectually enlightened need to be in power. Unfortunately, and that's not the case. Unfortunately, that's not the case. Because what's the problem with modern democracy? What's the problem with modern democracy today? Well, there's a voting system, and the goal and, of, and the achievement of, of the democracy and the voting system, it seems to be good. But it has injustice embedded in it. How? And this is what Plato argued. He said that in the, in the democracy system that we have, you have a person who is not an expert in a field voting on a particular matter that they may not have knowledge about. Exactly. So meaning that you may be a medical doctor, you may be a physician, for example, and I'm having you make a decision and voting on economic policy. That's not even your field of interest. That's not even your field of expertise. So how, how do you make that decision? Vote? Exactly. And vice versa. You may be an economist, a PhD economist, 
And I'm asking you a decision on medical systems mm. and how it should be uh, done and operated and how society should deal with it. It's unfair and unjust. And therefore, he said that democracy everywhere is mob rule. You have these gangs who basically form in these clusters and they begin to rule. So what is the solution? How do you get proper leadership that is successful? He said you need a philosopher king. A philosopher king who is able to take complex ideas, simplify them, explain them to the masses, and then take action by himself. Meaning, in the sense, he has total power. But he is, the, he is just and fair and equitable that he does not abuse his power in any way. This was the view of Plato and then Aristotle after him. Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, this line. Subhanallah. And Aristotle was, in, in, in our books of philosophy or Islamic philosophy, Aristotle is known as Mu'allim al-Awwal, the first teacher. Many years after Aristotle came a man by the name of Farabi or Al-Farabi, who is known as Mu'allim al-Thani, the second teacher. He came forward and said that this philosopher king that was being spoken by Aristotle, for example, and Aristotle came from that line of thinking from Socrates, then Plato, then Aristotle. Aristotle was talking about this philosopher king and the likes. Al-Farabi says, Mu'allim al-Thani, he says that this person that was being talked about by the former, the Greek philosophers, was none other personified in the life of the Holy Prophet Rasulullah He says Muhammad he was Muhammad. that philosopher king that the Greeks were talking about. That's what I was going to tell you, that through their intellect and logic, they came to the conclusion, because what, what you described is the attributes of an infallible leader. Because hmm. only an infallible leader Ahsan. will always act righteously, justly, and never uh, basically have any faults. Absolutely. Absolutely. Subhanallah. And this is exactly what Rasulullah did. He took the complex notions, the divine inspirations, the thoughts of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, simplified them for humanity, expressed them to the world, and then he took action on them. The problem is, every other time in history, besides two instances, what, then those two instances being very particular, everyone who has gotten absolute power has abused, has abused that absolute power. The only exceptions are Rasul al-Azam and Amir al-Mu'mineen, Ali ibn Abi Talib. These are the only two individuals that when they were given power, they did it equitably, fairly, justly, and established a system that the whole world could actually follow. It's unfortunate that the world was not able to take advantage, unfortunately. However, this is what the Ahlul Bayt السلام, exemplified in terms of leadership. Being fair, just, equitable with the people, telling them this is what, this is what we are going to do, explaining it in a way that they understood it, and then taking action on it and actually mobilizing a movement to implement it. It's not easy to do what Rasulullah did in a span of 23 years to change the face of the world. It takes leadership of the highest caliber to be able to achieve what he achieved. And then followed by Amir al-Mu'mineen, this level of leadership the world has never seen. Allahu Akbar. Where Amir al-Mu'mineen is ruling over Kufa, he's moved his capital to, mm. to Kufa four and a half years. Can you imagine a leadership and a governorship <clears throat> that there was not a single person who would go hungry under the state of Amir al-Mu'mineen? Can we say that in the modern world today? Can we say that? Mm. We can't say that today. There are many people, many people in, in many places, in America, in the UK, people going hungry in our backyards in this modern developed world. How? And that's really what the Ahlul Bayt Salam they tried to decrease the economic divide, bring people together. Maybe the people who are living luxuriously, although many of them were living very well, maybe they weren't living as extravagant and as luxurious as they may have wanted to. But at the same time, there was no person going to sleep hungry without food in their stomach. Mm -hmm. This is the, 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 the miracle of the leadership of the Ahlul Bayt And at the end of the day, we pray every day for Imam Al-Hujjah to come back and inshallah, <clears throat> Re-establish that system. And that's the only third time that the world will ever see. That's the third time and the only last time that the world will see true absolute justice. 
Because what happens is humanity or people who become leaders, sometimes the ego gets in the place, sometimes other things happen that they're not able to see the good of the people at mm. large. And they begin, it begins to become about the I as opposed to the we. The problem with us, normal human beings, power, it's like a curse. It does, it does affect us. It, mm. it messes with our minds. And then you have the whispering of shaitan as well. Mm. It's, it's, for us, it's illogical, irrational to have a leader without being infallible. Because having an, uh, a leader like one of us, then it, it's a recipe for disaster. Mm. It's, meant to ha it's a time bomb. Mm. That's why the only um, possible way for us going forward is having an infallible leader. And inshallah, bismillahi ta'ala, one day will happen, inshallah. With regards to leadership, if I were to try and identify one, what traits would I be looking for? Very good question. In terms mm. of the traits of leadership, many of them are actually exemplified by the Ahlul Bayt better than anyone else. Mm. And this is substantiated by much research in the model, modern world. The first trait that the Ahlul Bayt salam, taught us about leadership is the leader themselves must have a certain level of credibility in terms of their character. They must have integrity in this character. This is the same way Rasul al-Azam himself established, as we mentioned previously in episodes, this character of being sadiq and amin, being someone who's honest and trustworthy. He established this, and he, this was 40 years, the, his lifetime before announcement of Prophet. Oh, he established this character. And people trusted him and believed in him. The same with Amir al-Mu'mineen, uh, Ali ibn Abi Talib sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, People knew that this Ali ibn Abi Talib had the highest position after Rasulullah. That Rasulullah, they knew that Amir al-Mu'mineen was exalted to such a level that there was no comparison. That even Muslims throughout the world, Shia and non-Shia, doesn't matter. Whenever the name of Ali ibn Abi Talib would come up, they would say, Ali ibn Abi Talib, karam Allahu wajha. May Allah illuminate his face. May Allah brighten his face. Why? Because this was that person who never once in his life bowed down before an idol at any moment in time. And he was the first of the first with Rasulullah in the battlefield in every war, in every time. Whenever Islam needed assistance, Ali ibn Abi Talib was there from the beginning to the end of his life. From one house of Allah to the other. This was the life of Ali ibn Abi Talib. He sacrificed his entire life for Islam and there was no companion greater than Ali ibn Abi Talib that Rasulullah himself says that Ali ibn Abi Talib, whoever, whoever is Mawla I am, Ali ibn Abi Talib is his Mawla. Man kuntu Mawlahu, fahada Aliyun Mawla. This Mawla, it means master. That is the definition of the term, contextually. So this is Rasulullah's leadership reflected in the leadership of Ali ibn Abi Talib. They mirrored each other. Ali ibn Abi Talib did not learn from any teacher except Rasulullah himself. So the greatest mu'allim, the greatest teacher is Rasulullah, and his greatest student is Ali ibn Abi Talib. Ah, and in terms of those traits, so number one, they had character. Number two, humility. You'd say, how? A humility. Ali ibn Abi Talib and Rasulullah had the highest level of humility. A leader must be humble. Now, Rasulullah could have had the ability to be very arrogant. A'udhu billah min dhalik, may Allah hasha lillah. He is much above these uh, terms. But what I'm saying is Rasulullah could say that I am divinely appointed prophet of God. You must listen to me. And if he wanted, he could have descended the worst of calamities on people. But this was the prophet who when he would go to Ta'if, for tabliq, to give the mission, to propagate the message, yeah. they would pelt him with stones to the point that he would become bloodied and Fatima Zahra, his blessed daughter, would, would clean off the wounds. But Rasulullah, even in that circumstance, when people were pelting him with stones in Ta'if, he would raise his hands and would say, Ya Allah, O oh my Lord, forgive them, for they do not know who I am. They do not know my position. This was the Rasulullah. This was the humility. And this, this was the level that they went to to protect their people. The same with Amir al-Mu'mineen. 
And this is how they operated. Amir al-Mu'mineen, Amir al-Mu'mineen is too high. Amir al-Mu'mineen's deputies, let's go to Amir al-Mu'mineen's deputies, his commander, his right hand command, Malik al-Ashtar, we're told that he is walking in the streets one day when somebody, a young youth, begins to harass him and bother him. He was wearing the cloak over his shoulders, we're told, and he began to, he wanted to pull it off as, as an insult. And he pulled it away. And when he pulled it away, someone addressed him. He said, do you know what you just did and who you just did that to? He says, I don't care. He's like, do you know who it is? He, sa- he says, oh, is this, is it, that's, Mal- that's Ali ibn Abi commander in chief. He can have you finished in one second. He became very shaken. He followed Malik to the point that he went to, <coughs> he went to the mosque. And when he got there, he noticed that he began to pray. And when he noticed, he was waiting for the prayer to end. When he finished the salah, he was reciting salah separately. When the salah finished, he went up to him and he said that, I, I beg your pardon. Please forgive me. I'm the one who pulled your cloak. I'm the one who troubled you. I'm the one who bothered you. Forgive me, please. I didn't know who you are. He said, Allah is my witness. God is my witness. The only reason I came to the mosque at this time was to recite two rak'ah salah that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgives you for your action. Allah this was the level of this was the level of humility of the deputies of Amir. Allah Allah. Further humility. Rasulullah in the battle of Khandaq, he's giving a lesson to the Muslims on leadership. He says, Does anyone have any ideas or strategy for to protect us from the enemy, for example? He's asking all the people. One person speaks up, Salman al-Farsi or Salman al-Muhammadi. Ahsan. He says, Ya Rasulullah, where I come from in Persia, or he says, we dig a trench around us to protect us so that no enemy can come. Does Rasulullah not know this? Of course Rasulullah knows this. He's saying and he's giving a message that when you come for strategy, military strategy, or other strategy, take business strategy, advice. take advice, Ahsan. Take an advisor on board. So even while he was the leader, he was teaching us how to lead. Ahsantum. So what did they do? All the Muslims, they began to, they began to dig a ditch to protect themselves <coughs> against the other side. This was the level of humility that existed in Rasulullah, and this is the level of humility that existed in Amir al-Mu'min and his deputies, and this is how the Ahlul Bayt salam operated. Number one, character. Number two, they had the utmost of humility. The other was in terms of explaining, they understand, they understood human psychology better than anyone else. They understood how the mind operates. They understood how people actually be able to function and how they think. And they would explain things that sometimes were the most difficult of things in the most simple ways on the level of the people. I remember a story that comes to my mind about Rasulullah and how he tackled some of the most difficult issues. There was a youth, we're told, who once came to Rasulullah and he had a sincere difficult issue and a difficult scenario. And the companions are surrounded and sitting there. And that moment, this, this, this young man comes, he says, he says, Ya Rasulullah, I have a problem. Can you help me? Now, Islam is a religion that says there's, there's no shyness or shame in religion in the matters of deen. That the, the principles must be laid out. As an individual, I must have shame and modesty and integrity. A male or female doesn't matter. We must have modesty and, and shame and haya. But Islam must lay out the rules and the foundations. This young man comes to Rasulullah, we're told, and he says, Ya Rasulullah, I have a vice, I have a problem. And in my heart, I want to commit adultery. At that moment, all the companions get very upset. They said, this is Rasulullah, you're talking like this, what's wrong with you? Rasulullah says, hold on. I like Rasulullah, the leader, the demeanor of a leader, to not jump to rash decisions, mm. very calm, very cool, very collected. It's okay. Let's go for a walk. He tells the command, you stay here. Let me go with a walk with this young man. Let's go for a walk. So he go for a walk. They go separate away from the people. We're told that, he said, this is my issue. He says, 
Let me ask you something. Would you accept that someone would do this with your sister? I said, no, never. He said, would you accept that someone would do this with your mother? Like this is what we're told. He says, no, never. He said, then why would you want, why would you accept yourself to do this with someone else? Isn't that someone else's daughter? Isn't that someone else's mother? Couldn't that be someone else's mother in the future if not? Well, couldn't that be someone else's sister? This made sense to that guy. It sat in his heart. He said, you know, you're right. Whereas the others wanted to chop off his head, they wanted to kill him, they wanted to, they wanted to remove him mm. and be very aggressive. Rasulullah, with the adab and the akhlaq of Rasulullah, had that ability to be able to calm the hearts at such a level. This is what the Ahlul Bayt salam did. They had compassion for the people. They actually empathized with them. And they explained things to them on their level. I remember there was a, there was a mother who came to Rasulullah and said, Ya Rasulullah, my son, he eats too many dates. Can you speak to him? Can you tell him not to eat so many dates? Rasulullah says, come the next day. He said, okay, he came the next day. Rasulullah said, don't eat too many dates. He said, Ya Rasulullah, you could have told me this yesterday. Why did I have to go back and why did I have to come again? Rasulullah said, because when you asked me yesterday, I had just eaten some dates myself. And I didn't want to, him to tell him something that I myself am not practicing. Allahu Akbar. SubhanAllah. The level of integrity that Ahlul Bayt salam had, and they inspire us to have in our lives. To implement that in our lives every single day. Amir al Mu'mineen, did he not implement this? Amir al Mu'mineen, on his dinner table, while he's ruling, a, he's ruling an empire, the Muslim empire, that would spread over maybe 57 countries today. And he is ruling, and he, what is he eating? He's eating some bread. And some salt, some dry barley bread and some salt. And they ask him, Ya Ali, why such a simple food? You're the ruler of this entire, entire governorship. This entire kingdom, the Muslim empire is under your rule. You're eating so simple? He says that I have a wish. I have a desire. And that desire of Ali ibn Abi Talib, that desire of mine is to meet my Lord in a state in which I am hungry. Allah Allah Allah. Further, he, Amir al Mu'mini says, I do not Allah want Allah. that in my entire regime that I am ruling over, mm. from the north to the south, from the east to the west, I don't want a single dinner table to be spread tonight that is simpler than mine. There should be no one eating in this entire kingdom or this entire empire or this entire Muslim state or this empire that is eating food that is simpler than mine. I, if I'm ruling, I must eat the simplest food. I must live the simplest life. I must be the simplest leader. To the extent that Amir al-Mu'mineen's own shoes, he would patch them up. To the point that he would say, bear witness that I have not forsaken this shoe, but it has no more repair left for me to give it. This was Amir al-Mu'min. This is how the Ahlul Bayt al operated. Yet they question us, how can we love Allah Amir al-Mu'mineen to, to such extents? Yet they do not know. Allahu Akbar. It's, it's, Amir al-Mu'mineen Ali It's ibn beyond Ali. comprehension. Amir al-Mu'mineen was such an individual that Justice followed Amir al-Mu'mineen, not the other way around. Truth followed Amir al-Mu'mineen, not the other way around. That Ali ibn Abi Talib was the essence of truth. Rasulullah himself said, if you want to see truth, see Ali ibn Abi Talib. That's where truth is. Doesn't matter what people say. We have traditions that are very clear in this regard. That Ali ibn Abi Talib's status as a leader, as a status as, as the representative and the vicegerent, of Rasulullah is there is no there is nothing to come against it. There's nothing to oppose it. It's absolutely clear. Numerous traditions tell us this. To the extent we're told that there's a tradition 
that Amir al-Mu'mineen is present one day in the vicinity of Rasulullah and Abu Bakr enters upon them and Aisha is there as well. And Aisha is narrating this in the tradition. And Rasulullah is there present and Ali ibn Abi Talib is there. At that moment Aisha says, I saw my father was staring towards the face of Ali ibn Abi Talib and grilling his face in a state that his face was frozen on the face of Ali ibn Abi Talib. After Amir al muminin after Ali left, Aisha says, I asked my father, Oh father, why were you staring at the face of Ali ibn Abi Talib in such a state that you were not looking away? He says, My daughter, have you not heard from Rasulullah? Al-nadharu ila wajhi Ali in ibadah. That to look towards the face of Ali ibn Abi Talib is worship. This is, this is, these are clear narrations that tell us the position of Ali ibn Abi Talib beyond a shadow of any doubt. To the extent that Rasulullah says, "Ana Madina tul ilm, wa Aliyun babuha," that I am the city of knowledge, and Ali is its gate. Ali is its door. If you want to enter into the city, you go through the door. Then afterwards, his some people, and this is this is very clearly authenticated by other scholars of the non-Shia school of thought, mm. who have authenticated that these are. Traditions that have been falsified and added much later that have said somebody is the foundation and somebody is the door and someone is, for example, the lock. You know what's problematic? And even I was just listening to a scholar from Ahl Sunnah who was not a Shia scholar who said, do you know what the problem with this tradition is? That where they add on and they say so and so is the foundation. You know what the problem with that is? The problem with that is that when you say that someone is the foundation of knowledge, the foundation is primary over the building. So you're saying that person has, has a higher position than Rasulullah himself? That person, whoever wrote this, did not have a clear understanding of how a building works and did not have a clear understanding of how the world works. To the extent that this person wrote, an individual wrote that the lock on the door is Muawiyah. Allah 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 this Allah is the extent that people have gone to to try to lower the position of Ali ibn Abi Talib salawatullahu salamu alayhi for 90 years Ali ibn Abi Talib was cursed in the Friday ceremonies why why such animosity why such hatred towards the personality of Ali ibn Abi Talib why such hatred towards his children people must wake up and ask these questions what's going on here the reality of the matter is people understood that they could not aspire and rise to the level of Ali ibn Abi Talib. Therefore, they tried to bring him down. Envy dr drove them mad. Envy drives a person mad. And this is the tragedy of the world in which we live. Yeah. Human nature throughout times has caused people to do some of the worst of things. Ali ibn Abi Talib, yet Ali ibn Abi Talib, strived and hoped for the best for everyone. That when on the 19th of Ramadan, when he is struck on his head, Amir al muminin in the masjid, in the state of sujood, with that sword that has been soaked in poison over time, Ali ibn Abi Talib, when he sees the person who struck him, Abd rahman ibn Muljam, and he sees him in that state, and they bring some water, or they bring some milk for Ali ibn Abi Talib, for Amir al muminin he says, give it to him. Give it to the one, the one who struck him on his head. He says, give it to him. I can't stand to see him in this state. Allahu Akbar. Amir al-Mu'mineen. Amir al-Mu'mineen is not a light title. Amir al-Mu'mineen is only for Ali ibn Abi Talib salawatullahu wa salamu alayhi. Because he exemplified leadership at the highest level. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chooses his leaders. And no one selects leaders better than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ahsant. Indeed. Ahsantum. Well, Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. I mean, I'm a bit speechless, to be honest with you, after listening um, to your beautiful speech on one of the best leaders this planet has, you know, ever seen. And uh, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us with uh, the leadership of Imam al-Hujja, Allah ta'ala, Faraj al-Sharif. And we truly, I truly hold, hold, wholeheartedly hope that, uh, that that time will not take too long to come yeah, because yeah. We've, we've been for too long orphans. We've been for too long orphans from Ahlul Bayt And uh, I, uh, I hope that uh, your words have um, 
pierced through the hearts of every believer like it has done to myself. Especially um, <clears throat> tonight will be Laylatul Qadr. And uh, it's the night where Amir al-Mu'mineen was struck in the masjid by Ibn Muljam Ratullah And I hope uh, this incident will help us contemplate and reflect upon the life of Amir al-Mu'mineen. This Amen. personality as you could not have uh, explained better. And inshallah, I hope that, uh, I hope uh, our brothers and sisters throughout the world can use this inspiration, Amir al Mu'mineen, to bring that fire, they reignite the fire, the love of Ahlul Bayt, and reignite the fire of Wilaya in their hearts, and also use it to penetrate through the destruction, uh, destructions of uh, dunya, inshallah. So we can eventually uh, build that foundation that is required for the Imam's return. Uh, with that being said, uh, Sayyidina, unfortunately uh, we've come to an end of this program. I uh, would like to thank you all, dear brothers and sisters, respective viewers for being with us. Inshallah, I hope this um, show has been as beneficial to yourselves as it has been to us. Uh, with that being said, I uh, would like to wish you all uh, a splendid and joyful as much as can this night. Iftar with family and friends and remember us all in your du'as and most importantly, Imam Al-Zaman, Ajallah Ta'ala Faraj Al-Sharif. Please do pray for the hastening of his reappearance. And inshallah, we'll see you next uh, Saturday. With that being said, uh, thank you all so much for being with us. Wa alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. Wa sallallahu ala Muhammadin wa alihi al-tayyibin al-tahirin.